I feel uh, kind of like, uh, well, I've been here before, so I need no introduction. You know that, that line? Uh, I'm thinking of a story that uh, our good friend Professor Kitchen tells about now that he's getting old, he has these little brain moments where things sort of get stuck. And he was inviting, he was giving the introduction to a speaker, and he walked up to introduce them, and he couldn't remember the guy's name. And so he said, I give you our colleague who needs no introduction. <laughs> so I feel a bit like that tonight. I need no introduction. But last time I was here, I was focusing more on some of the historical and archaeological aspects of the Exodus narratives, and in particular, what we call the indirect evidence that makes a strong case for the historicity of the Exodus. When at the end, question time, and this is what, two, two and a half, three years ago, the question came up about the location of Mount Sinai. I said, well, that's really a topic for another lecture, and so here we are. Now, some of you may remember that I offered a somewhat tantalizing title called, Where is Mount Sinai and Why It Doesn't Matter? <laughs> now, that may sound disappointing to you, but that will be where we end tonight on why it doesn't matter. However, the whole lecture really got a little bit out of hand and much broader in topic because I thought the subject we're dealing with, in particular, as the title suggests, critical review of some popular Exodus theories in many ways requires not just the work of an archaeologist and a biblical scholar and a historian, but the work of a geologist. Many of the people who we'll be talking about tonight and their particular theories really lack the credentials to be making fantastic theories and proposals that are very popular and very well known, especially in Christian circles, through videos and popular books. We'll be coming back to that a little bit later. Now, if we only had that GPS, <laughs> we would know where the Israelites went, where they crossed the sea, and what mountain they ended up in before going to the land of Canaan. Unfortunately, we don't have that. What we do have, however, is many important pieces of evidence that we'll try to piece together. This is why there are disagreements about the location of Mount Sinai. This is why there are disagreements about the location of the sea through which the Israelites crossed. And there are many imaginative suggestions of how to explain these things. In fact, at one point, I had been able to identify more than 14 proposed Mount Sinai locations. That number is now increasing. There are disputes even about when the exodus occurred, and as was implied in Mark Lanier's introduction, whether there was an exodus at all. Well, uh, I have no doubts about the last point. I have lots of questions about when, where, and so on. And we're going to try to do that first by uh, reminding ourselves that our primary source is going to be the Bible and other supporting evidence. But just to give you a sense for some of the books, and maybe you've seen uh, some of these, and maybe you have them on your bookshelf, uh, I would say all except the one on the bottom right. I, well, I won't say anything about that, but you, you can get it autographed later tonight. <laughs> now, what we want to do is just to show you some sense for, in this clip, some of the Mount Sinai locations and you can see them in yellow, and they are scattered from North Sinai all the way down to a couple hundred miles into what is present-day Saudi Arabia. The red marks indicate where, <laughs> you guessed it, the Red Sea crossing would have been. And here again, you can see all sorts of theories, all the way from the Mediterranean Sea in the north, in North Sinai, and several locations on the Isthmus of Suez, and 
uh, increasingly uh, people have uh, looked with interest in what we today call the Gulf of Aqaba, and you can see several locations there. The Mount Sinai locations, and here, by the way, are, are simply five, and I'm not going to talk about all of them or even individually assess them, but these are some that you will read about. And furthermore, uh, I bet that some of you have probably even been to this one. This is the traditional site of Mount Sinai in St. Catharines, southern Israel. My good friend Rabbi Skolnick, um, some years ago we, we walked early morning, two in the morning. I pointed the path and I said, I'll be back for you in about five hours. I'd climbed it already three, four times, and he uh, and a couple others went off climbing this mountain. I bet some of you have here. Anybody climbed Gebel Musa? Yep, some of you have. Well, when he got back, he said something very profound. He says, I didn't believe this was Mount Sinai, but now that I'm climbed it, it is. <laughs> he wasn't going to climb another one. <laughs> In any event, uh, this, is, this is what the Google Earth image looks like, and you can imagine of course, the Israelites encamped in this wonderful Raha Valley, which is over a mile long and a half mile wide, and the front end of the mountain on the right is in Arabic known as Gabal Safsafa, Safsafa Mountain, and the back part of the massif is the, the peak that uh, the tradition of the monks at St. Catherine's Monastery believe is where Mount Sinai is located, but it's part of a whole uh, massif of granite. Now, it's important for us to realize that there is no archaeological evidence, to my knowledge, and I've been studying this for a long time, to support any one of these locations. That is, some ancient inscription from 3,000 or more years ago saying this is Mount Sinai. By and large, we archaeologists know such things don't usually exist. If you find an inscription identifying the place you're excavating, that's very rare, and often it simply confirms what was known from other sources of information. Now, you may leave disappointed tonight because my analysis of the biblical data is, is largely this. What the Bible allows us to do is eliminate candidates, but not necessarily with any certainty say, this one is. What the biblical data can do is say, this was, would be within a range of possibilities, other are outside of that range of possibilities. So what are the biblical data that we have to work with? Now, the Bible does provide us a, a journey that begins with the crossing of the sea, and we'll get back to that, in Exodus 15, 22, and we can follow the movement of the Israelites uh, both here and in Numbers chapter 33, where there's a, a very similar itinerary of the travels, although it has some places uh, mentioning uh, particular places where the Israelites camped that aren't mentioned in the book of Exodus, but at least we have this data, and we'll take a look at it in a moment. We also have a reference, such as Exodus 19.1, that gives us an indication of, of the arrival of the Israelites at this location, Exodus 19.1. We also have, very clearly stated in Exodus chapter 12, the departure point where the Exodus began, and in Egypt that is a, a place called Ramesses, which is almost universally accepted as the ancient city built by Ramesses II. This is something I talked about last time, so we don't want to repeat that tonight. But we know where they started from, and we also have a very important datum that on the edge of the land of Canaan, the Israelites camped and stayed for a period of time at a place called Kadesh Barnea, and we're told that that was an 11-day journey from Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. Now, that's an important datum which even some critical scholars uh, take seriously because 11 is not a number of any symbolic significance, like 7 or 12. It's a number that so, is so odd that it looks authentic. The location of Kadesh Barnea is also fairly well agreed upon 
and that would be between two different sites, and you can see on the upper right-hand side uh, the general location of Kadesh Barnea. There's a site called Ein Kudirat, and just to the south of it, only about six miles, is another site called Ein Kadis. Ein means spring. This would be a source, a perennial source of water. So you have these two springs, six miles apart, Ein Kadis. Kadis, you may hear an echo of the word Kadesh. And uh, Kadis is Arabic for holy. Kadash is the uh, ancient Semitic word for holy. And so within that circle somewhere, there is universal agreement that this is where the Bible was talking about. On the other side, on the left side of the map, you can see Ramesses, where the Israelites began their journey according to Exodus 12 and according to Numbers 33. There's complete agreement between Exodus and Numbers on this point. Now, I want you to pay attention to this uh, chart that's laid out here because it's very significant when we get to trying to understand the possible sea location crossings and the possible location of Mount Sinai. If you look on the left side, you see that the Israelites start at Ramses, and throughout Exodus and also in the Numbers itinerary, it talks about the encampments, that they encamped here, they encamped there, they pitched their tents. This is where they spent. Uh, often we're not told how long they spent there, but we are told that, that these were uh, a day's journey apart. Uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. But the thing I want you to notice here, well, two things. One, look on the left side, and you see that from the starting point to the crossing of the sea, which in the Hebrew text of the Bible is Yam Suf, which means sea of reeds, the Greek translation, which appears in most of our English versions, the Greek translation, known as the Septuagint, renders this as Red Sea. Now, that sounds very similar in English. All you do is pull out an E and you got to go from red to read. It's not that easy in Hebrew. In Hebrew, the word red is Edom, like Edom cheese, if that helps. And uh, the word for reeds is Suf. Again, there's no doubt about that because Moses' mother placed his basket amongst the reeds. Same word, okay? Not among the reds, the reeds, okay? Now, notice then we actually have three places the Israelites camped between Ramesses and when they reached the sea. Now, that should tell you the distance is not that great. However, if you go from the crossing of the sea beginning in Exodus 20, 15, 22, or look at Numbers 33, it's unclear whether they had eight camping spots or 11. And the reason it's not clear is because after the crossing of the sea, the text is explicit in saying they journeyed three, a three-day journey or for three days into the wilderness of Shur. Now, it's not clear whether that's three days and then they start naming places, Mara, etc., or if the three includes the first three places mentioned. So you could say it's minimally eight days of travel from the crossing of the sea to the mountain or 11 days. The next big question is, what's a day's journey? They didn't use kilometers. They didn't use miles. They used day's journey. How is this reckoned? Well, most travel in the ancient Near East, even with donkeys, as you can see in these two ancient images, the lower one of which is in Sinai at Sirabit al a very important place, um, and uh, certainly one of the candidates for Mount Sinai, the, the Gebel, the mountain, Sirabit. Um, but you can see this uh, gentleman riding on a donkey, but being led by people on foot. So even if you could afford a donkey, and you can see in the top picture, which is about 1840 B.C., that the animals are actually being used to carry little kids on the far uh, left side of your screen and to carry equipment on the donkey more up in the front. So basically, when you travel, you're walking. Your animals are carrying your, your, your gear, your food, your supplies. So you have to keep in mind that basically a day's journey is how much you can walk in a day, not how fast you can ride your donkey. There's a wonderful statement made of Muhammad Ali who had to make a very fast trip uh, from, 
a place he was in Sinai or the, uh, the Negev, I can't remember exactly where it was, but it said that he made a five-day journey. This is this 150, 200 years ago. He made a five-day journey in one day. What would normally be a five-day journey, he did it in one day because it was really rapidly done on camels and charging away. Very different. But even until recent times, travel was thought of as a day journey. Now, uh, based on what we know from both ancient texts where we can trace the movement of caravans between point A and point B, places like Mari and nearby cities, we reckon that uh, this would be somewhere around 20 to 22 miles a day is sort of an average of what a day's journey was. And again, some would say because they would travel from first the crack of dawn till sunset, you may be under good conditions could go as much as 24 miles. Again, the terrain will, will, will vary and therefore adjust how much you can travel. You're going uphill, you're not going to travel as far on a day's journey as if you're nice flat ground. So a day's journey is, can vary, but it's, it's, it's more or less a fixed distance. But conditions can dictate longer periods of time. So 20 miles a day, again, this is based on good anthropological data from modern uh, study of Bedouin as well as ancient texts. And they both seem to agree that about 20 miles is a day's journey. Now, what that then suggests, if we use this average, and, you know, it can be plus or minus a mile or two, I don't, I don't care. What this suggests is with three encampment sites, the third being at the sea, the distance from Ramesses to the sea where the Israelites cross should be not much more than 60 miles. On the other hand, if we allow for eight to 11 days journey from the crossing of the sea to the location of Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, then we're talking about a distance of 160 to 120 miles. So it's very clear that the distance from the crossing of the sea to the location of the mountain should be three times or more the distance of getting to the sea. Now, this is an important point if we use the biblical data, and I believe responsibly. As you will see, some of the locations uh, for Mount Sinai in, in a little bit uh, later would require the Israelites to travel something like 80-some miles a day which, you know, I believe in God, but I also believe they walked. Uh, what we have here is a roughly 60-mile range from Ramses, figuring on three days' journey, and that would give you a range within which you should, if we take this information in a straightforward fashion, where the crossing of the sea should be. On the other hand, from Kadesh Barnea, you can see a circle, uh, and, and you can see that re larger red circle indicating the 220-mile uh, range. Now, again, this is as the crow flies, and as we know, the roots were not necessarily as the, as the crow flies. Here are some of the roots that are known from ancient times, how to get in and out of Egypt, and uh, you can see the most northern one. This is where we were excavating, and I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Uh, the secondary route, which is well known, especially in the book of Genesis, in the patriarchal narratives, where the way of Shur is the way that the uh, patriarchal uh, families and uh, Hagar travel in and out of Egypt and so on, because they're going up to uh, Beersheba in the southern part of Israel. But just to give you some idea, these are the main known east-west travel routes, and uh, the, the lowest one of them all is actually... Uh, better known from Islamic times, is called the Darab al-Hajj, which is the way that the Egyptians would cross Sinai to go to Arabia for the pilgrimage to Mecca. So it's a more modern uh, route of the last uh, a thousand or more years. So here again you can see another map, same map, but showing you the known ancient routes, and the yellow lines represent the routes the Israelites would have had to have taken to get to the proposed Red Sea crossings or Mount Sinai locations. And uh, some of them, you might say, are quite literally off the chart. Um, some 
as you can see, are actually within the range we're talking about. But the distance, for instance, that uh, one would have to travel from Ramesses to cross the sea of the Gulf of Aqaba, as some people have proposed, uh, would require the Egyptians to, or the Israelites and the Egyptians who pursued them, to go all the way down to the southern tip of Sinai and cross from the southern tip of Sinai. Um, and I've driven that, by the way, in a car, and it's a very uh, slow drive even uh, in a car, let alone uh, trying to walk. But in any event, uh, some of the problems of travel, when you consider the actual location people are posing, don't really make sense, but we'll come back to that more. So, for instance, here we have uh, one of the locations from outside that many people know, Gebel Musa on the left, and on the right side you can see Gebel Alaus or Jebel Alaus, um, which is very popular uh, in, in certain circles. And uh, what we want to do is to look both at the biblical data and the geological data. And I'm going to play a, a video clip here just in a moment, and it'll give this a wonderful transition for me to step out of the way and my colleague Steve Mosier to come talk to you about the geology. But I just want you to, to realize that for this very uh, popular location to work, you basically have to stand the biblical itinerary upside down. Because what this means is the location of Mount Sinai, if you cross the Gulf of Aqaba to this Jabal Alaus, is not an 11-day journey. It's not an 8-day journey. It's maybe a 1- or 2-day journey. But to get to the location to cross would require you 8, 10, 11 days, whereas the Bible makes it clear it was 3 days, suggesting a location much closer to Ramses. So these are the, 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 the biblical data and looking on maps and saying what really is feasible and what isn't. So now I'm going to introduce another video clip and I will get out of the way for my, my colleague. Sorry, I jumped my cue. I'm still here. We all remember from Exodus chapter 2 that Moses, when he fled Egypt from the wrath of Pharaoh, went to the land of Midian. There he married a Midianite woman who, uh, of course, the Midianites were the, were the descendants of Abraham through a second marriage, a Keturah, that uh, we, we can read about in the Bible. But uh, you can see where Midian is located. Midian is the very northern part of what is today Saudi Arabia. And so this is, is seen as an important reason for the argument that was just made in the, in the previous video clip. In fact, uh, the verse that was quoted uh, there by Robert Cornuck is Galatians 4, 20, uh, 24 and 25. I'd like to read this verse. Uh, you can read it yourself, but I want you to hear me read it. Now, this is an allegory. First lesson in hermeneutics. If the biblical writer says this is an allegory, what does that tell us? It's an allegory. <laughs> These are two women, our two covenants. One is Mount Sinai, bearing children from slavery. Her, she is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Okay. Now, here you have the reference to Arabia. Now, does anybody know when Galatians was written and by whom? Paul. Sometime in the first century A.D., okay? The question we have to ask, which the speaker you just heard on the video clip doesn't do, is he gets out a modern-day map and says, where's Arabia? You don't do that <laughs> when you're looking at a 2,000-year-old map. The question is, where is Arabia when Paul is talking? Not where is Arabia today. That's the first fundamental flaw. There are a lot of others, but that's an important one to start with. I want to point to another note because I think this is significant and often overlooked. It's in Numbers chapter 10 where the Israelites are about to leave Mount Sinai and Moses is trying to encourage his, his brother-in-law 
a Hobab saying, hey, you know this area, you know this region better than we do. Come with us, guide us, help us along. You're a desert guy. You know, we grew up in the Nile Valley. We don't really know this terrain that well, and we'll take good care of you. Now, this is happening at Mount Sinai, right? Read the text. But he, Hobab, said to him, I will not go. I will depart. I'm going to leave this area and go to my own land and my own kindred. It's very clear from that statement that Mount Sinai is not located in Midian. Hobab is saying, I'm leaving here, wherever I am, and I'm going to go back to Midian, where my family is. So he's clearly drawing a distinction between where the mountain is and where he and his family live. They're not the same place. Now, one other thing is very interesting, and that is to look at this map. Well, before you, while you're looking at it, let me just point out that as early as the time of Herodotus, in the 5th century B.C., Herodotus, a Greek traveler, historian, a very wonderful writer about the, the world that he, he was living in around Egypt and elsewhere. The Greeks were fascinated by this, and, and he traveled. And he talks about being in Egypt. That's a whole wonderful book in and of itself. But when he leaves Egypt, this is 450 B.C. You want to give me an equivalent? Ezra's time. Around the time of Ezra, He's leaving Egypt, and he says, when you leave Egypt, you come to Sinai of Arabia. As early as the 5th century B.C., Sinai was equated with Arabia. Now, look at this map, wonderful map of the world, uh, dates to A.D. 775, and I'm going to zoom in a little closer, and here, basically, what you have, and we've reoriented it uh, to our world, and what you see is Egypt on the left with the Nile Valley and so on, and in the red and the yellow circle is the Sinai Peninsula, and notice the water surrounding it is painted red. It's called the Red Sea. So they actually called it Red Sea. There's no doubt about that. But look in the yellow circle, and that's the Sinai Peninsula, and if you can read sideways, thank you, Jerry, I see that head, uh, it says Arabia. In fact, if you read carefully, it says Sinaiacus Arabia. Sinai was equated with Arabia from the days of Herodotus all the way down to the days of Paul. So we don't look at a modern-day political map and say, where is Arabia? You look at a first-century map and say, where is Arabia? Arabia was a name applied to Sinai. Now, you can see the problems that crossing the Sinai, and we'll come back a little bit more to this in a moment, but you can see the route proposed. These are the actual routes proposed by uh, these explorers that we've been looking at. And um, uh, here are some of the better known ones, Ron Wyatt on the left, Robert Cornock, whose video you just saw, and Dr. Leonard Moeller. What's interesting is that not one of these uh, gentlemen are trained in, in biblical uh, Hebrew, none of them are trained in archaeology, none are trained in history. And, and I, I think about this and I say, this is very interesting because I don't think any of you who would have to go to surgery and have your heart worked on, like Professor Kromikoff, would say, you know, I'll take a plumber. <laughs> you know, plumbers know about pipes, you know. Uh, these gentlemen don't know archaeology, don't know history. How's that song go? Anyway, uh, <laughs> but yet they come and speak in churches, speak in community groups, and, and make a big splash. But you can see the problems because according to the, the line you see going across top of Sinai and down and that little triangle zigzag, that for them is Exodus 14.2 where Israel makes a shuv, where it makes a turn after they traveled about 120 150 miles, they make the shuv that the Bible has them making on the second day after travel in Exodus 14, 2. So they claim that they're just taking the Bible later, following it like a map, and you can see the problems. Now, I'll get out of the way. Good evening. 
Uh, it's my pleasure to give you a geologist's perspective of some of these ideas that are very popular uh, today about the Exodus and to um, hopefully shed some light on those. Uh, I understand that people are very emotionally attached sometimes to these ideas and it's not my intention to make anybody mad, but it, it, I, I do feel a responsibility as, as a, a geologist, an educator, and a, and a Christian to at least share the expertise that I have uh, um, and the opportunity I've had to look at, at this information. I suspect there may be some geologists in the room. This is Houston, after all. I started my uh, career as a geologist working here. It's great to be back. Uh, so I'd enjoy uh, interacting with some of you, perhaps, after, uh, uh, after the session tonight. What you've seen is a, a video clip which uh, presents the idea of crossing in the Straits of Turan at the southern part of the Gulf of Aqaba. And it, it's a very attractive idea because there is a, a narrow passageway there. And the proposal is that there is a land bridge between these reefs, these small islands that cross the, uh, the straits. And there's even a, a nice illustration of what it would look like if the water were, uh, were drained. Uh, this is a satellite view. Uh, and uh, we will be looking, as you see, we'll be looking at a lot more um, satellite views. Thank you, Google Earth. Um, but this is showing the straits, and I'd like to share with you some, some real bathymetric, that is, subsea depth uh, information uh, published by the Israeli survey, um, uh, an Israeli marine geologist, John Hall, showing the, um, the straits here. And uh, in fact, it isn't a simple land bridge. If we look at uh, the channel over here uh, on the, the southwest, we see that it's uh, some 252 meters deep, and on the other side, it's uh, about 90-some uh, uh, meters deep. And furthermore, walking, if, if any of you have uh, snorkeled around a reef, you know it's a, it's a pretty rough topography and uh, would, would be a very difficult, very difficult walk and somewhat treacherous because uh, coral are very sharp and, um, and actually dangerous if you, if you scraped yourself on them. Um, so the, the question is, um, could the, um, the miracle of the parting of the sea involved water being removed that is as deep as uh, some, some 250, uh, 250 meters? And um, many people would, would question that, but I think in my mind, it's, it's uh, not responsible to suggest that it's just a, a, a cakewalk across the, uh, the channel there, and, um, and, and people should be aware of uh, the actual conditions. Now, likewise, up at Nueva, another crossing, which is presented uh, mostly by Leonard Moeller and um, previously by Ron Wyatt, there is a nice little wadi and a delta here at Nueva, and um, the suggestion is that the uh, Israelites came out here onto this delta, the, the sea parted, and that was a, an easy walk, and there's even presented this uh, underwater land bridge here. But again, even though this is the information that you'll see uh, on the internet or in videos uh, or in, in some books, So this is fantastic, evidence of the chariot wheels on the seafloor and some very compelling pictures, not just of, of, of um, objects that look like wheels, but objects that are coated in gold and, and uh, also coral formations that simulate wheels that have been uh, turned on end on their axles as if the chariots were just turned over on their side and then corals would encrust them. Um, just to say something about the corals, I do contribute to a, a marine biology class uh, at Wheaton College, and I, I have had the opportunity, I think the blessing, to uh, do some snorkeling and uh, scuba. Um, unfortunately, not in the, uh, the Red Sea area, but, but in the uh, Caribbean. Uh, and it turns out that, that this is actually quite a, a, a typical formation of coral, a particular species of coral that is called a table coral. And this, this photograph, is, it's a little bit different from the one that we saw uh, on the video, but it, it's essentially the same kind of formation. The coral grows up as sort of a stalk and then, 
and then spreads out. And this picture was actually taken close to a lat, so uh, maybe that's where the crossing took place. But nonetheless, they're very, very common, and, and I'm confident that they're not encrusted uh, coral. Uh, uh, they're not in encrusted chariot wheels. Uh, we could look at uh, a chariot here. This is from uh, the discovery of uh, King Tut's tomb, and, and indeed we do have a, a, a gold-covered chariot wheel, uh, but we see they're, they're much more slender and uh, fragile, if you will, and in, in, uh, not as robust as the, at least the recreated uh, photograph that, that we saw. Um, another comment that was made by, in the video was that coral shouldn't grow on coral, and I, I don't understand why that would be a problem for uh, coral to encrust uh, a gold-coated wheel like that. And certainly, I would think within less than 100 years, the wheel would be completely covered. Uh, any object that's left on the seafloor is going to be completely uh, covered in uh, marine organisms, uh, and in fact, probably also uh, buried somewhat in, in the sediment. Uh, many people have suggested that, uh, here's, a, here's another photograph of, of this, that uh, it may not be one of uh, uh, the, the Pharaoh's chariot wheels. Um, take your pick uh, which wheel that uh, it, might actually, it might actually be. Uh, this uh, speaks to the idea that there is a land bridge at, at Nueva here. Uh, where the uh, Israelites could easily cross, um, bring in some more of uh, Dr. Hall's data, and we see that it gets to 900 meters deep there. Certainly to the north, it's a little deeper. There's a basin up there that, that gets down uh, in excess of 1,000 of meters, and then to the south, there's another deeper basin. Uh, and as the sediment poured out of this wadi and across this delta and out into a, a sea fan, it did build out and, and create a shallow, uh, a shallow area, but, but shallow being uh, at the deepest, nine, 900 meters. So, and again, again this um, diagram, which is very widely distributed, simply doesn't match the facts of the, uh, of, of the bathymetry. Uh, this is an in, a very recent uh, PhD dissertation, and it shows the uh, bathymetry in some detail, and then plots the um, the depth. So we have depth over here um, on on the y-axis, and then distance from the coast on the x-axis. So you realize, uh, realize that it, it it it's exaggerated, uh, but there is a a, a rather uh, precipitous. Uh, drop to um, those depths of uh, 800 to 900 meters. And then uh, some of my geophysics friends uh, in the audience will appreciate this. These are uh, seismic profiles showing the stratigraphy or the strata that accumulated on this uh, deep sea fan. And what I find very interesting is um, you have this nice uh, package of, of parallel la layers, more or less parallel layers of, of sediment which are being deposited over time uh, on this deep sea fan. If there had been a parting of the waters um, opening up a 900 foot uh, passage, and then that water suddenly re re uh, returned, I would expect all kinds of scouring here and, and redeposition of the sediment, and I really don't see evidence of that on, these, um, uh, on, this, on this geologic data. Um, now let's look at uh, Jebel al-Laz, which has been popularized. Uh, this was a best-selling uh, book, uh, New York Times best-selling book, about uh, 15 years ago. And uh, also the Exodus case, Leonard Muller's book, is, is very popular. As, uh, and we saw a video clip um, from a video that, that promotes this, uh, this view. This is a Google um, Earth view of Jebel al-Laz, and uh, you see that one of the features of the mountain that made it so attractive, and we can read the, uh, the quote here, uh, the blackened rocks on top of Jabal Allah's, the outer coating of these rocks uh, have the appearance of being burnt. The Bible says that God descended on Mount Sinai in flames of a furnace. Could these be rocks charred by the holy fire? And, uh, and then the other quote is, is very similar. So much has been made about the black top of Jabal Allah's, well, I'd like to show you a little Google Earth um, video here as we, we turn around and, and ascend. 
we can see that the black rock on Jebel Laws really covers a lot of area. In fact, it, it, it continues down the flank, and, and it's really just another rock formation. I obtained the geologic map of the area. It was uh, provided by the United States Geological Survey uh, back in the 1960s. And what we see is that the um, light-colored granite is it's referred to as a pluton or a, a batholith, and it's intruded in the subsurface when uh, the rocks were much uh, lower uh, beneath the surface. It intruded the, uh, the greenstone and the slate, uh, which is the black rock, which is thought to be the burned rock uh, from uh, the fire on, on the mountain. And, and so this is referred to as a roof pendant when we look at it from, uh, uh, from space. Uh, here we can see um, the older, the greenstone is actually older than the, uh, the, uh, the, lighter, the lighter colored granite. And uh, this is a, a very instructive because we can see uh, all of the fractures in the rock. They've been deformed as the, um, the, the Sinai and Arabia and the Egypt have been rifted along the Red Sea rift area. Uh, we see lots of fracturing. But we can also see how the uh, granite, when it intruded the greenstone, you can see the veins of the granite that intrude into the greenstone. So if this was uh, a, a, a fire-produced uh, late uh, kind of, of phenomenon, you'd expect all those veins to be uh, charred as well. Now, some of the granite does have a black coating, and much has been made at this. I suspect this is granite that's a little further down on the flanks of the very peak of the mountain. And you can see that in this case, the author here has uh, broken a piece of this granite, which is black, but on the inside, it's, it's white. Well, this is really a, a very common phenomenon called desert varnish. I took these photographs at Maktesh Ramon in Israel. I also have photographs of these in, from, from um, Nevada, where there's a, a process of weathering microbes and, and, and weathering uh, on the surface of the rock will turn it, will turn it black. So I, I doubt that this is a, a phenomenon uh, that, that we could relate to uh, Moses' experience at the, uh, at the mountain. Uh, another feature there is referred to as the split rock, and the idea is that um, this is the place where uh, God commanded Moses to strike the rock and water poured out of it, and there is uh, uh, some photographic evidence of what looks to be uh, 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 weathered rock, uh, weathered by erosion. But if you remember all of the, the cracks that we saw in the, the space photograph, um, there are many, many veins and fractures there. And I, and I believe that this split uh, part in the rock wasn't uh, something that happened very suddenly. I think it's, it's really a remnant of, of erosion along a vein in the rock that uh, had uh, a lot of... of um, a deformation, you can see that here, this photograph, see the very sharp line from fresh granite to deeply weathered granite. I, I think this is just a, a feature of the tectonic history of, of the area and has no particular significance to uh, some kind of spring. Uh, this is another Google Earth, Earth picture uh, showing, uh, showing that. Apparently, there, there are archaeological features there. There are paintings which are, are thought to represent the calf, the golden calf that was built. There are foundations. There are um, uh, column bases that are thought to uh, add up to the number of uh, tribes. And um, archaeological reports that we've been able to find suggest that these do not date to the, uh, to the Bronze Age. So now I'd like to move into some of the other kinds of questions, uh, and I call these um, process-oriented questions, uh, because how did it happen? And, and these are the theories that speak to the plagues, speak to the parting of the sea, speak to the provision of food and water. I can't cover all of these, and I don't have expertise uh, to address all of these, uh, but these process theories are interpretations that appeal to natural or scientific explanations linked to specific geologic, geographic settings for the places and events. It's kind of like the black rock on top of the mountain being an example of here is something geological that fits what uh, we read in the, uh, in the scriptures. And uh, here's an application of a process theory. A very popular idea in, in uh, many, many books 
is the um, involvement of the Thera volcanic eruption in, in the uh, Greek islands that occurred sometime in the, uh, in the Bronze Age, and that this could be an explanation for plagues and, and uh, even for the parting of the sea, and I can explain it this way, following an, uh, a recent uh, book written by a, a, a well-educated geologist um, and published by Princeton University Press, The Parting of the Sea, the idea is that when Thera erupted, it wasn't just one single event. Most uh, volcanoes just don't erupt once and shut down. There's, there are many stages in its eruptive history. So perhaps the first a stage produced a pyroclastic cloud that, that moves down over the delta, and, and it uh, um, explains the darkness and perhaps some of the onset uh, ecological disasters of the, of the plagues. And then another eruption might involve uh, basically the collapse of the island, creating a tsunami that goes off in, in, um, uh, toward the um, Levant, the, the, the uh, eastern Mediterranean. And this um, tsunami, this wave uh, that's produced by the displacement of the water at the volcanic eruption uh, could explain you know, a water receding and then uh, returning to perhaps uh, trap Pharaoh's army in one of these northern uh, crossing areas. Uh, the problem is that the eruption has been very precisely dated. There was uh, a study that took a, a twig of an olive uh, tree, a branch of an olive tree that was buried in the volcanic ash, and they were able to date with radiocarbon uh, four of the rings of that tree, and were able to very precisely um, put the date, it's somewhere between um, uh, 1,627 to 1,600 BC, but this is hundreds of years before um, two of the popularly accepted Exodus dates based on scholarship, and, and perhaps most of the scholars in this room would, have, um, would, would prefer to go with the late Exodus date. So the, to involve the Santorini eruption uh, in the Exodus as, a, as an explanation is, is probably uh, a bit of a stretch. Uh, another uh, possibility, though, would involve tsunamis uh, that are not created by uh, volcanic eruptions, but a landslide out here on the cone of sediment off the, off the Nile Delta, and the tsunami would set off a wave which could certainly affect any of the uh, bodies of water that are suspect reed seas in the, in the northern, northern area. Now, I don't want to say whether or not this is what, how it happened, but it is a, a possibility that something like that could explain the parting of the sea. Um, now, there are some uh, authors, uh, like this um, uh, television uh, journalist, uh, um, uh, Simka Jekovici, you may be familiar with the, the very um, uh, popular uh, television uh, program that was backed with uh, James Cameron's uh, money, uh, Exodus Decoded. And uh, this is an example of someone who's explaining every single thing in the Exodus, even from just a few phenomena, and he um, uh, proposes simultaneous volcanic eruptions, gas, poisonous gas, seeping up through the ground, earthquakes, submarine landslides, tsunamis, uh, and he sets these all at a date that doesn't really even agree with the accepted dates for the Exodus, uh, the, the accepted pharaohs that are uh, proposed for the ex Exodus, uh, and certainly it is inconsistent with the Santorini uh, Thera eruption, which he, which he uses. Um, there are some interesting ideas for the uh, parting of the sea, and one idea it involves wind, because it, it says in the scripture that God uh, used a, a wind to, to part the sea. And uh, here's a, an experiment that was uh, shown on a National Geographic um, documentary some years ago by physicist uh, Colin Humphrey, and uh, let's, let's play that. And uh, the idea that he proposes is that this is uh, occurring in, in, in uh, the, the um, northern, the Alat region, northern Aqaba. Now, there is some serious um, possibility that something like this could work. Uh, this is a peer-reviewed online journal, plus one, 
And uh, this author, a scientist with the uh, United States, um, um, one of the weather uh, surveys, um, has shown uh, using a, what, what is, is close to a, a, a reasonable reconstruction of the, the paleogeography. I'll say that because he used my map, essentially. And uh, uh, he, he adds a few things, but he shows that, that a, uh, a wind of, what does he have, 63 miles per hour could actually blow water um, aside for a while and, and allow um, uh, some dry ground to exist. But the question is, can you even walk? in uh, winds of 63 uh, miles per hour. You know, a hurricane force one is, uh, uh, is, is 74 miles per hour. Some people question whether you can even do it at, at under 40 miles per hour. And, and you here know in Houston what it's like uh, when you have winds like that. Uh, so while I think it's, it's interesting to speculate, um, we can't be sure of exactly how it, how it happened. Now I'd like to move on to some other volcano theories. And these have to do with volcanoes, mostly where we actually have some volcanic activity in Arabia. And I'd like to call your attention to this map that um, is um, actually available through, through Google Earth. Uh, but it's a catalog of, of active volcanoes uh, created by the Smithsonian Institution. It's their, their global volcanism program. And notice where the, the volcanoes are. And, and this is just so you know that, that um, there are many, many documentaries on television, all of the science cable stations, and you just can't believe everything you see on those, uh, on those stations. Here, here is a documentary, National Geographic, Exodus Revealed, um, and this is the commentary from a scientist, a geologist in Hawaii in a helicopter, so that you can't hear him, so they have his uh, transcript. He says, imagine the Jews reaching this massive land bridge formed by lava. And so the idea is that land bridges, um, as they occur, lava pouring into the sea, are actually kind of temporary. They tend to collapse. They're very dangerous. If you go to Hawaii and they have one of these land bridges, there'll be signs, don't go out on the land bridge. Uh, in fact, they even create this map down here uh, that shows uh, the possibility of, of lava stretching across the the strait there that we just talked about. And they even produce a map showing the location of volcanoes that don't exist. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, 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 it is a bit scary when you can't trust National Geographic. <laughs> now, here's another uh, compelling volcano theory. This is from, again, from Colin Humphrey. He, of course, had this idea of, of coming across the uh, uh, the, the uh, area south of Elat in the Gulf of Aqaba, and his candidate is Allah al Badr. And this indeed is a, um, a, a volcano of known, a fairly recent activity. And his idea is that this eruption of this uh, mountain was uh, the source of the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And he said, if you draw a straight line between here and P. Ramesses, it's, it's just a perfect. Uh, uh, um, a, a straight shot and uh, would, would guide them as they, as they went. Um, there was an eruption in about 640 AD. It may have been from this mountain or a similar, you can see the cone uh, over here, uh, and local Bedouins reported that um, there, there was some damage and there, there, was some, there were some fatalities. However, there is no documented eruption from the time of the, uh, of the exodus. Now, as you'll see, this, these um, areas that are beyond our circle here um, are questionable, um, but, but certainly uh, still interesting. And uh, what we'd like to do is to um, uh, now give you an idea of why we think that, that it's necessary to stay within these, uh, with these circles, and I'm going to turn it back to, uh, to James. In my last appearance here, and this video is still available, you can see some of the backgrounds to what we're talking about, but I am not going to repeat what we did before, okay? That's something you can go back and look on the wonderful Lanier Theological Library website. So I don't want to repeat that, but a, a couple highlights that we do actually have an ancient map from the period of the Exodus roughly speaking, 13th century B.C., and this is on a wall at Karnak Temple, 
And why this is, is significant is because it actually shows us the line of forts that defended the main entry to, to Egypt. And why we think this is significant, and this is developed in detail in my previous lecture, so I won't go into all the details, but the point that one of the forts named on this sequence is called Migdal, and that, of course, is the name of, of, of a place the Israelites passed by or camped near in Exodus 14.2, and we're also told it was beside the sea. Uh, I'm going to uh, speed up just a little bit so we can all get to refreshments, which is why we are here. Um, <laughs> This is, this is a result of Steve's work, years of work, uh, on reconstructing the paleo environment. What was the area of, on the eastern frontier of Egypt and North Sinai like when the Israelites exodus, Israelite exodus would have taken place? Uh, the map you see here actually is an improved, uh, updated version of what I would have shown you some years ago. But let me just take you now to taking the data, the geological data, the archaeological data of the forts, and showing you um, that the road out of Egypt that the Israelites originally avoided, Exodus 13, 17, was lined with forts. And you can actually see, and I had the, the privilege of discovering the, the fort at Tel El Borg, but when we combine this, uh, we learn that the, the location of Migdal, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, that fort it may well be the one that's mentioned in Exodus 14 too. It's a real fort. The Hebrew word Migdal means fort or tower. And here you have this fort by a sea. In fact, it's by two bodies of water. You can take your pick. Uh, we've got two of them. Rabbi Skolnick thinks it's what we call the ancient lagoon, at least he used to. Some of us think it's the green body of water to the south. But uh, again, go back and look at that video if you want. Now, one of the things that this, our work has shown us now that we know where there were bodies of water 3,500 years ago and where we know there were forts, we now know something else we didn't know before. It made sense, but now we have the information, we have the data. That brown line you see isn't just an imaginary line in the sand. It's actually a road. The Egyptians called it a road. And we have actually found, we're in the process of getting this uh, ready for publication, we actually have a section of mud brick road. You cannot drive chariots across sand for hundreds of miles. They have very skinny wheels. Just find some desert around here and try to ride your bike. <laughs> it doesn't work well. They actually had to have roads. And what you're looking at here is a section of road that's been cut off and the rest of it's worn and deflated and gone. But this road is, is probably um, half the width of, uh, of the chapel here, the chapel. So there were actual roads. And the Israelites to be pursued by chariots would have had to be near these roads and near these forts where chariots were kept. And by the way, we found very good evidence of chariot location, chariotry in uh, the forts we excavated. Um, I proposed before, and uh, we'll come back uh, again to the video, and, and we've suggested that the Balach Lakes here on Eastern Frontier is within that range that the Bible would allow, the, the three days of journey and about 60 miles, because there's actually a turning back, a shuv, a change of direction. And we also have the uh, reference to the plagues, uh, the, especially the, the locusts, and by the way, this is a real picture of locusts in Egypt with the pyramids in the background taken not too many years ago. It's still a problem from time to time in Egypt. And we are told that the Lord drove a wind that blew the, the locusts from Ramesses, which you see in the center of the map, off into the Sea of Reeds to the east. And you can see that body of water is, which I, I think I suggested before, presages what's going to happen to the Egyptian army. The army of locusts is drowned in the sea, anticipating what's going to happen to the armies of Egypt. Now, I know some people are worried that this is some puddle out there in the desert. Uh, Steve and, and uh, my son over here helped with some of this work, uh, surveying and so on, and he can answer more questions for you. But um, uh, we know from our preliminary work that this body of water would vary depending on the time of year. But based on the top topography of the lake, it could have been as deep as 15 to 18 feet. And that can drown a horse, that can drown a person, 
et cetera. So um, that's why we believe that the Israelites moved south towards a place called Sukkot, as Exodus 15 suggests, moving to the edge of, of the wilderness. They're told to shuv, to make a, a turn, which they do, Exodus 14, 2, and move up into this region. Now, uh, again, this is our hypothesis. If you want to see it in more detail, more nuanced, look at the video. Mark will be very happy because that's why they put it up for you to look at it. And off they would have gone eight to ten days' journey from this point to wherever Mount Sinai is. We believe somewhere in south-central Sinai. I think there are a number of possible candidates that we can allow. I think we can, we can dismiss the ones in present-day Arabia. Now, just, uh, just a couple minutes to wrap up and to suggest to you why it isn't important where Mount Sinai is. Now, some people have made this an article of faith. But I want to end with this. The reason Mount Sinai was important is because what the Bible suggests happened there. Namely, that Mount Sinai is the place of God's revelation. Initially, of course, in Exodus 3, it's by this mountain of God where God reveals His name to Moses. And it was here, of course, that the law was given, according to the Bible, Exodus 20 and following. And we're told that God's glory came down on the mountain in Exodus 19. And that glory, the kavod of God, dwelt in the mountain, making it a holy mountain, a holy place. We are also told that after the glory of God settled on the mountain, that the glory of the Lord settled in the tabernacle. The glory of God occupies, settles into the tabernacle, and of course the word tabernacle, mishkan, means settle, reside. So the same word that's used of the, of, of the glory of God settling on the mountain, now the glory of God settles mishkan in the, the tabernacle. And as we know from the narratives that God's glory went with Israel from that point on, which which is why in a letter to Sir Colin Humphrey I said, how can you say it's the volcano that the Israelites were attracted to because this light led them on their way. Did the volcano move? And he never answered my letter. <laughs> so the glory of God fills the tabernacle. That's the final statement of what happens in the book of Exodus. So the glory of God fills the tabernacle. The glory of God goes with Israel. And when we get to the building of Solomon's temple, we're told that the glory of God, 1 Kings chapter 8, fills the temple. And that is why, because God's glory that first appeared at Mount Sinai now ends up with His glory on Mount Zion. And this is why Mount Zion becomes so important in the Psalms and elsewhere in the Bible, because it becomes, in essence, the Mount Sinai. Old Mount Sinai is an important relic of the past. It's where God's presence is, that's important now. And that's why I think Mount Sinai fades in importance in the Bible, and only Elijah goes there as far as we can tell in biblical history. But for the rest of the time, the focus is on God's abode in Mount Zion. So while it may be interesting to know where Mount Sinai is, we can't say for sure where it is. I think we can clearly eliminate a number of candidates because of the geographical description we have of how long it took to get to this point, how long it took to get from here to Kadesh Barnea, that allows us to eliminate candidates. I don't think we can say for any certainty, with any certainty, that it's Mount St. Catharines, Mount Jebel Musa, Sirabit al Qadim, uh, uh, Jebel Sin Bishr. These are all plausible candidates based on the descriptions we have. But beyond that, I think uh, we have to wait further evidence, but I also conclude with it really doesn't matter in, from a theological perspective because it's where God's glory is that mattered, and that happened no longer to be Mount Sinai. So I'm sorry if I've disappointed you, <laughs> but this is where we believe the data leads us both from a geological, uh, biblical, geographical, and archaeological perspectives. Thank you very much.
If you've got questions for either of these gentlemen, be writing them down, be passing them forward. We'll do questions for about 10 minutes, then we'll recess to uh, 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 refreshments. Uh, I will also tell you that there is an interesting uh, uh, bit of evidence being developed that will soon be published by Professor Kromakov down here. It may have some relevance on this issue with some uh, findings that he discussed with us today and yesterday. Uh, including some uh, ancient inscriptions. So you may enjoy visiting with him. We may have to have him and, and Jim and crew back in a, a year or so after your book comes out and hear, hear some more. Do you think it is necessary to look to process theories to explain the plagues, the crossing, etc.? It's uh, difficult for me to evaluate these, these various claims. I think that some of them are fascinating, interesting. Um, clearly, they are a combination of geological, meteorological, and ecological catastrophes. Sometimes they do happen simultaneously. So I think they're interesting, but I think ultimately they don't always fit all of the biblical data. And sometimes a miracle is a miracle. So it, it just may be that um, we can't explain some of the things that happened. Is a 20-mile average for a day's journey applicable to any size group, small, large, or enormous? Yes, the question, the, the question is, and, and by the way, you'll notice uh, the idea of a day's journey, it's like a marathon. I heard a, a, a friend speak a, a rather humorous talk about how he ran the marathon, and he was so enthusiastic, he was running, and... and and he had this horrible thought as he crossed, crossed the 10-mile line and saw the time, and he said, the Kenyans just finished. <laughs> because he knew that he still had another 14 miles to go or whatever it was. But a marathon is 26 miles. It doesn't tell you how long it takes you to get there. And a day's journey is a certain distance. You may have to go a little bit longer to get there, but that's how they measure distance. Or you could say a mile. Um, I can't walk as fast as I used to, but a mile is still a mile. So that's the, the factor, not, not how long. There is a side note to this question that I think, uh, Jim, might be, might be interesting for people to hear your perspective on this. The gentleman or lady says, I ask this in light of the millions who left Egypt in the Exodus. Oh, boy. I think you might enjoy uh, explaining a little bit. my green book. Yeah. Um, yes, well, that's, this is a question we often get, um, and that's why it's addressed in my, my, my green book. Um, do you have my green book and the yellow book over there? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So there you have both the green book and the yellow book. The green book deals with this uh, because it is an important thing. Uh, in Exodus 12, where it talks about 600,000 men, uh, the Hebrew, Sheesh Ma'ot Aleph, 600,000 men, the question is not, is there 600,000 men, but what is 600? Elif mean? And the word Elif has, can have three or maybe even four uh, plausible Hebrew translations. The problem is our, our English Bibles translate this as 600,000, but it could be just as easily rendered 600 clans. Uh, Jesse, the father of David, refers to, uh, tells David, okay, when you go, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this is Gideon, I'm sorry, Gideon refers to his Eliph is the weakest in Israel. My clan is the weakest in Israel. It's a subdivision of a tribe. Uh, David uh, goes to visit the commander of his brother's Eliph in Hebrew, unit. It's a military unit. Um, and so there are different ways of translating Eliph. The problem is all the English versions that you read translate as 600,000 men, and therefore, by the way, making it larger than the U.S. Army, uh, the Egyptian army, the Israeli army leaving Egypt, the Egyptian army at that time, from the 18th dynasty down to the Ramesside period, would have been between 25 and 30,000. So if Israel had 600,000 men, they didn't need Moses, they didn't need God, they could leave any time they wanted to leave. <laughs> okay. Um, isn't it distrust in God's mighty power if we try to explain the miraculous work of God with possible natural phenomena? Steve answered it one way a minute ago. Let me answer it a different way. And I would say that the problem with that question is that it presupposes 
a non-biblical worldview. A biblical worldview, there is no d distinction between natural and supernatural. And this is the problem. If you believe that God is the creator who controls and sustains, then all phenomena in nature are not natural. They're a part of God's created order. And so I think it's a mistake to try to say this is natural, this is supernatural. When the sun rises in the morning, uh, often I'm standing washing dishes in the kitchen, and I say, praise God, you've done it again. I don't see it as just a phenomenon of astronomy. And so I think the problem with that question is it reflects uh, the worldview that creates this dichotomy between uh, natural and supernatural. So I don't think it's wrong to look for natural. What I think is wrong is when the natural becomes the, the way to explain everything, as if somehow, if we explain it naturally, that leaves God out. And, and for my theistic worldview, I would say God is intimately connected with everything that goes on. Okay. I have heard about the Ipuwer papyrus that has an account like the biblical plagues. What can you tell me about it? Uh, it's a stretch to say the papyrus Ipuwer. Um, uh, I do discuss it and quote from it in my yellow book, so feel free to buy that. <laughs> but papyrus Ipuwer does refer to the calamities that happened in Egypt during the period when Egypt did not have a ruling king that controlled the land. And when the king is in, in control, of course, everything is in order. When the, 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 the king is not in control, the land falls apart, the Nile doesn't flow properly, the sun doesn't shine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we have these in a number of different texts. So papyrus where some people point to as reflecting the, uh, the plagues. These sort of things are described in, in numerous other uh, literature of this particular genre. So Ipuwer is not alone in that. The complaints of Chachep or Seneb, Prophecy of Nefertiti, all of which are in the yellow book. Okay, so the last question I'm going to read, there are a ton of people in here that I would love to hear their learned responses to this, but I'm throwing it out there for you too, though this is not really fair for geology. Mm -hmm. Considering Asiatic population in Egypt, West Semitic names of Hebrews in the Exodus, and Egyptian names, we might add, Moses, who grew up in Egyptian context, what do you think was the original language Moses used to have conversations with his people and with God? What was the original language of the law? Whatever Moses is recorded to have written, Canaanite, Egyptian, Amorite? Yes. I want dessert, man. <laughs> well, I would say the uh, answer to that is so simple, you could ask your Dr. Kromelkoff and he could answer that. <laughs> um, well, all we have, all we have is, is the, are the biblical records written in Hebrew. Um, and, and scholars debate, you know, the exact part of the linguistic branch, and we increasingly realize that in Canaan, we, we think of Canaan as a homogeneous unit, but we, we now, I think, are beginning to see that there are dialects and different things going on. There were dialects within Egypt in ancient times, as there are even within e uh, Egypt uh, present time. So uh, I, I would simply go with the simple answer that, that the Bible is recorded in Hebrew, uh, most of it except for small portions in Aramaic, its first cousin. And so I think we're, the question more is, the, the script seems to evolve as does the language over time. There's what we call late biblical Hebrew. Uh, Dr. Gary Rensberg has done some work on, on those sorts of things. And wave your hand, Gary, people want to talk about um, historical Hebrew grammar and so on. We got a number of experts here, but uh, I would defer to that to them. But my simple answer is, is Hebrew, and the origin of that as a language is a whole other question. I'll leave that to those. All right. Questions. Recognizing that you two need to get over and get some food, get prepared to sign and to talk, I would suggest you make your exodus through... <laughs> <laughs> Someone will part those doors. Thank you very much. Thank you.